Welcome to the Precious Testimonies broadcast. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. In the Old Testament book of Psalm, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, Precious Testimonies has been called of God to do just that. And we're to do that by giving born-again Christians an opportunity to share what Jesus has done in their lives to the glory of God the Father and, of course, the Holy Spirit and, of course, Jesus himself. And so with that, we're going to let you hear some people sharing how uh, God has worked in their lives and what this Jesus has done for them and what he means to them. And I pray that this will be something God uses to either help you come to uh, a precious relationship with God or grow in your relationship with God. And with that now, let's listen to what uh, some folks have to say about this great and mighty Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. What's going on? This is Dave, the solemn servant. I grew up in a really good neighborhood uh, down in uh, South Florida. And around age four or five, up until that point, everything was normal. Uh, then my parents started to fight. They started to have a lot of problems. And eventually my dad left. Around that time, my mom also got sick. She got lupus, epilepsy, developed some other disorders, things like that. Uh, she had to be put on some, some medications, not only to maintain her diseases, but also for pain, to control the pain, things like that and she became hooked on those medications. So life without my dad in the house was kind of difficult because I never had anybody to guide me to show me what it's like to be a man, how to fight back, how to stand up for yourself, how to really grow up like you should. At the same time, my mom, though she loved me, she didn't really have it in her to give us both a mother's side of life and a father's side. But, you know, growing up, Life was kind of insecure like that. I had to lock down the house myself every night. It was dark outside, you know, it's just, there's no man, there's nobody there to really take charge. So then eventually, you know, when I got to age 13, I remember that day real clearly. My mom, she died that day. I came home, it was a bright sunny day from school, and grandparents were there. We got a call, grandma answered the phone. She dropped the phone, started crying, and then I knew what had happened. Um, she died and the world got cold. Now I remember going to the funeral thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna do now. Everything just died for me, because I didn't know God. I didn't have any source. My mom was my source. She was my everything, you know? And I just lost that in one split second, gone, just like that. Didn't even get a chance to say goodbye, you know? And took it for granted, because we all do that to people we love. You know, we don't, we don't know how to appreciate them, you know? Well, when she was gone, that was it. Had to live with my dad after that, and my stepmom. And I didn't, you know, I resisted authority. I, I didn't really open up, didn't trust anybody. Started hanging around with the people who did accept me. And uh, we all had our own issues. And started smoking weed, started drinking alcohol. I got into cocaine, you know. Um, also got into hip hop. I was really heavily into that, um, which was a double edged sword. It had its good sides and its negative influences also. Um, had some overdoses on the drugs. Started skipping school. Dropped out of school. Always had a plan I'm going to be some big time rapper, this and that, you know, or a basketball player, which I didn't even play on the team, you know. And all this fluff in my head about what the future's going to be like, but not really making any moves toward it, you know. And uh, so finally, uh, after dropping out of school, I'm living with my friend and um, just getting worse with the drugs. I got my inheritance money and um, I ran through that pretty quickly on drugs. Just, just bad way of living, you know, was into pornography, was into just whatever I could do to kill my pain, to try to, you know, try to find girlfriends and stuff to fill that pain, and, and the answer wasn't in any person, because nobody did it for me, they were all human, and then no matter what substance I put in my body, no matter how much hip-hop I listened to or music I tried to write, it's only a temporary fix, it doesn't really solve the problem, it doesn't answer the questions in my heart, you know, and I always believed in God and Jesus, but didn't really didn't really know him, you know. So, I met a girl, my wife. We got married. You know, I didn't, I didn't treat her the best that I should because I really didn't understand 
what it's like to be married at age 18. So we carried on, um, almost went through a divorce that first year. Uh, then uh, I, I quit doing the drugs because I wasn't getting high anymore. I was just, you know, we moved up to Lauder Hill, Florida. Just a, a total different environment. You know, there was access to, you know, I, I had guns that I bought illegally. You know, I, I got robbed at gunpoint up there. Just got into all kind of drugs. There's, there's, there's a lot of crack sales up there. There's drugs everywhere. There's just, there's fighting. It's a, it's a whole nother environment, you know. Um, and, and, and met that crowd of people and started trying to do what I can do to fit into that environment, you know. And you just, you just gotta make it work. And that's what I did. So I stopped doing the drugs though. And I wasn't getting high anymore, so I backed off. Started getting pains in my head, fingers twitching, different symptoms and things like that. And I remember going to the doctor just because I was kind of scared, but I always felt like, well, when I'm 80 years old, I'll repent, I'll get right with God then. I'm just gonna live my life for myself right now. I'm gonna do what makes me feel good. It's all about me. It's all about me, you know? Which is kind of what we all say, isn't it? So, the doctor says, you know, you need to have some tests done on your head. You could have a brain tumor. You could have some really bad things going on, and we want to rule that out and make sure you don't have that. As soon as he said that, it's like, ton of bricks just dropped on my head. I realized for the first time, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to stand before God. And if it happened right now, I'm pretty positive that I wouldn't go to heaven. I know I'm a backstabber. I know I'm a slanderer. I know I lie, cheat, steal. You know, the, the really big sins like murder. No, I haven't done that. But, but I've hated everybody in my heart who, who did me wrong, you know. I hold grudges, you know. I, I just, I'm revengeful, I'm spiteful, you know. All the bad things inside, those things I recognize that these are problems. And in that moment, I was afraid. I was scared to death of dying. Because I knew that somehow if God was real, then he was going to be right, he was going to be fair, and he was going to know how to judge me based on the truth. And the truth was, is I was in bad shape spiritually, you know. And outwardly, you could say he's not a bad guy, you know, but, but the truth was the truth. So time went on, I'm living afraid, never went to get the test done. One night I'm watching Christian TV and I see this guy on there, um, you know, that I always used to hate because I thought he was taking people's money and all this stuff, which I'm not here to give you an opinion about him, but I'm watching TV and now it's different because I have a need. I'm scared to die. I might be sick in my head, don't know what's wrong. And then I just said, God, is that real? Are those people really getting healed? All of a sudden, God came in that room somehow, you know, and he healed me. Whatever was wrong with me, it's, it wasn't, you know, the, the pain left. But more important than that, the love came. And for the first time, I saw the intentions of God. He was saying, yes, I'm right here for you. I love you. And I just, I just started crying. I just started pouring out my heart to God, you know. And, and I said, God, who are you? Allah, Buddha, Jesus, what is your name? I want to know you. And I saw in my mind Jesus dying on the cross. And, and for the first time, I was no longer afraid of hell. I wasn't running from hell anymore. I wasn't scared of it anymore. And I didn't want to go to heaven. I wasn't looking for heaven. I felt like I was right where I was supposed to be. I found heaven. I found Jesus. I found the Savior. I found somebody who didn't just die for the world. He died for me. He made it personal. And I could taste it. Well, let me tell you, ever since then, I didn't get it perfectly right. I sinned plenty since then. I've done a lot wrong. I didn't start going to church right away. Many months before I even got baptized. Didn't, didn't read my Bible or anything like that. But he was with me. Something happened in that moment. I, I can, how could I resist that? I knew my sins. I admitted my sins. How could I resist that? And I received the forgiveness because it was right there for me. And ever since that moment, that's called being born again, regenerated. He gives you a new life. And that's what he did for me in that moment. And when I went back sinning, he hunted me down. He disciplined me and he brought me back. He brought me back. I didn't do it, he did it. And that's the trend and that's what he says he'll do in the Bible. So the Bible's true. Everything that I see that he said he was gonna do in the Bible, he's done it for me, you know? And now I know for sure that on that day, there's a savior who stands up for me and says, your sins have been paid for past, present, future. Now I live my life for him. I'm walking in repentance, I'm walking in his love. And the life I have is far more exciting than it ever could be in a life of sin, of emptiness and hollowness and, and just loneliness that this world offers. So my question to you is, what are you going to do with your life? 
Are you living for him? Do you know him? Has he changed you? Have you seen how his power can change the inside of your heart? Work on the depth of you that you don't even know how bad it is, that you can't even touch, that no one can see? That's where he wants to operate. And he wants to heal you. And he wants you to understand your sin and that you've offended a holy God. But he's died for your sins to pay for them, to take that out of the way forever and bring you into an everlasting relationship so you'll never have to worry about hell again. And he'll work in you so that you live for him. And he'll change your life so you want to live for him. And it'll bother you when you sin, so you will live right. This is the trend of, of every true Christian. This is what the Bible says will happen. So I just want to say, don't, don't wait. Why wait? Why wait and, and try all these other methods when, when the method that God made, the one and only method, through his son himself coming down here in the flesh to die for our sins to make the road back to himself plain and clear the only way that he made back don't resist it just embrace it he's here for you thank you for watching have a good day hey everyone today i am doing a really special video and this video it means a lot to me i've been thinking about doing this video for the longest probably ever since i started my youtube channel and this is pretty much going to be my story and how I came to Christ and just all the struggles that I went through and that made me who I am today. So if you would like to hear my story, then just keep watching. To start off this video, I want to go ahead and start from the very beginning from how it all started and let's just go into my childhood. I went through something really traumatic as a child um, and I don't want to discuss that because I don't want this video to be about that. It scarred me for life however it made me who I am today. I remember as a little girl feeling very shameful of myself, having low self-esteem, hating myself, and just all around just not liking who I was and often I questioned how valuable my life was. I mean this was me as a young girl. I did not like myself. I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward to when I moved from Miami to South Carolina and I moved when I was in the fourth grade or fifth grade and that was a kind of hard move for me just because I didn't know anyone. I was the new girl in town and I looked very different from everyone because, um, yeah, I have thick eyebrows and dark features and I, I looked different. Going through what I went through when I was little, I isolated myself. At this time, everyone had their own group of friends and, you know, I was a new girl in town so I didn't really have many friends. I was new to all this and on top of that, I was very shy and I just, I didn't know how to make new friends. I remember being in middle school just being hated by by girls and um, I, I, I found a, a couple of girls but I mean I just remember dreading going to school hating to go to school because I would always be picked on I was bullied I would get girls that just wanted to fight me literally fight me physically and I didn't know how to stand up for myself I remember specifically asking a girl I'm like and, and she was like oh I want to fight you I'm like what did I do to you and I remember her saying to me, I just don't like you. And I've also gotten, I just don't like the way you look. I just don't like the way you act. I just don't like being around you. I mean, it was just, and I, re I started believing them. And I remember specifically one day, one night, me looking into the mirror, questioning my life. Like, I, I was like, why am I here, you know? And... I remember not having any makeup on and I had acne so I remember looking in the mirror I'm like oh you're so ugly you know no wonder people don't like you I could just see the faces of girls just being so mad at me and and I I believed that and I kind of fell into their trap and started 
believing into the bully. Towards the end of middle school, um, eighth grade, I started, you know, branching out and finally found a, a good group of girls. But still, once again, I just, I didn't open myself to anyone else. You know, I had a, a group of girls that I trusted and I didn't let anyone else in my life because everyone that I would, I, I'd always get hurt. So let's go ahead and fast forward to high school. High school, I was still very shy, quiet, reserved. And I, I remember getting a lot of girls saying that I was stuck up. They didn't know me, but I was still stuck up. And, you know, I thought I was better than everyone. And it was, it was, it was miserable. And I remember meeting my husband at the time, or his boyfriend at the time, and I remember admiring his his outgoing personality, how, how people love him. He definitely cracked open that shell that I was curled up in a ball, and I just, looking back, I've, I just missed out so much in life, being that shy little girl. But it all happened because of my past, my history. So, let's go ahead and fast forward to when we graduated. I finished high school, my husband did too. He joined the army and I remember right before, we, we were talking about marriage, but you know, here, black, back and forth, whatever. And right before he went to boot camp, my father-in-law had sat us down together. We did a prayer together and asked the Lord to come into our lives and and for him to save us and I remember at the time it just it didn't mean that much to me I didn't take it all that serious I just did it just because he asked us to it wasn't for me it was more to just you know please him and I did that not knowing what God had in store for me and I think that was the turning point and that's when God really started working in my life. Then my husband goes to boot camp and I stayed back of course and um, well we weren't married yet so let me just call uh, he's my boyfriend. My boyfriend <laughs> ooh, he goes to boot camp right and I stay back and I remember my husband's family always asking me, Crystal, you want to go to service with us? You know, come to church with us? And da da da. I didn't. I was not interested in going to church. You know, I'm like, uh uh, no, nah, I have to work. And I remember now that I'm talking about this, um, I remember specifically requesting to work all day on Sundays. Right? <laughs> I know. Yeah, that was me. I, I requested, hey, you want me to work? Because that way I have an excuse, right? Oh, I don't, oh, I gotta work. Can't go this time. Maybe next time. Anyways, so they're like, you know, Crystal, you can request to um, get your mornings off. I'm like, all right. So I did that. And then I started going to church. I didn't have an excuse now, right? So I started going to church when I first walked in. It was so crowded. All I can see was people. It was it wasn't me and God. No, it was it was people all around me. So, um and I remember feeling nervous. Everything was so new. I was scared. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into, you know? So listening to the service, I really wasn't focused. I was more focused on everyone else. I kept on going to church because um, I guess I wanted to impress my, my future in-laws, right? I kept on going to church and I always listened to the lyrics because we'd be singing the songs and listening to the lyrics, really f soaking in the message. And I just, I was just hit hard. And it's like every time we would sing a new song, I just wanted to break down. I, I'm like, oh gosh, what is this? I have never felt this, you know? what? Wh I don't understand this. I don't understand this feeling. Kept on going to church, and then, f and then I started focusing on the actual sermons. And it seemed like the message was focused on me. Everything, I was, it was freaky. And let me go ahead and tell you what church I went to. It was Anderson Mill. And I'll go ahead and link 
the church website down below because you can actually see live sermons on the website so you can stream them live so that's pretty cool um go ahead and link that down below every message was towards me and then i was like man god are you speaking to me i mean it literally hit me in the face with a brick my husband but he was my boyfriend at the time while he was in in boot camp God was working in my life and I didn't even know it. Fast forward to when he came from home from AIT. We rushed into marriage. I, I was like, I was determined to become a true Christian. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to give myself to anyone unless I'm married. You know, I, I didn't want to waste another minute on a man that, that's not even my husband. So I was like, you know what? We need to go ahead and get married. You know, we if we want to take this serious, let's get married. At the time, I thought that I was gonna stay home or in South Carolina while Jose he while he went to the new duty station. So he went to the new duty station. During that separation, I I felt like God was really working in my life. I just started more so falling in love with Jesus, not so much believing him any, anymore is more like falling in love with him. It's a feeling that is like no other. I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward to when I moved to Kentucky. When I moved to Kentucky, I was really lonely because this was the first time that I moved away from my family. Being married so young, everything was really new to me. So rather than getting support from my husband. I was wanting it for my family, but my family wasn't there because they were miles away. It was really hard in the beginning. I remember feeling really depressed because I just wanted my family. Now that I think back, you know, what was I doing? You know, you got married. You need to rely on each other, on your husband. And of course, the Lord. The Lord's your foundation, you know, and I think in the beginning of our marriage, I didn't take that serious. So we found another church, um, Southeast Christian Church. I'm going to go ahead and link their um, website down below because they actually have sermons online too. We started going to this church. It was about 45 minutes away, so we didn't go every Sunday. So I would just go every so often. I remember the guy saying, this is going to be a different service. And he talked about the importance of being baptized. And I've always wanted to be baptized because I've never been baptized. And... I was like, oh my gosh, this, I'd love to be baptized. And then he started talking about, you know, the, the, the meaning of being baptized. And I, I was like, oh, I want that. And then he's like, today, if you want to be baptized, today's your day. And I remember looking at my husband, my face lit up and I was like, oh my gosh, God's calling me to do this. I have to. I have to be baptized. I remember looking at my husband and, and he was like, you want to do it? You want to do it? I'm like, yeah. It was so, it was scary. I remember feeling anxiety walking down the stairs, but I wanted this. I was like, I want it. You know, if, if I want to claim that I'm a Christian, I need to go full on, right? My husband and I, we actually got baptized together. And um, I remember, well, first it was Sharon. Um, she, the, the people who we'd, we'd go with, she wanted to be baptized. And, um, and so I think her wanting to go kind of pulled me to go too. So um, we all went and my husband got baptized first. And, and then he baptized me. And that was... The most freeing moment of my life. All the weight, all the depression, it was it was gone. Like, wow, I'm I'm reborn again. I'm I'm new. In that picture you can actually see like when I when I first got up and just I, I was so happy feeling I'll never forget because I remember feeling new. I remember just loving my husband more and feeling free, not having that weight on my shoulders anymore, trying to do it all on my own. I I was like, you know, from now on, I'm trusting in the Lord to 
to direct me where I need to be in life. The word love had so much more meaning to me than ever. I thought I loved my husband, but at that moment in time, I was just like, man, I... I love you, you know, and I love the Lord. I love God. I, I love, I love my life. You know, I have meaning in life now. I, I was so hurt in the past, but now I just, you know, I forgive those that, that have hurt me along the way. And, and I mean, forgiving definitely changed my life too. God says, you know, forgive those who've done wrong to you, and and I and I did, and and that was definitely a changing moment in my life. Now we're gonna fast forward to when my husband deploys. I remember specifically one day driving in the car, and if you know me, okay, I be bumping to some Jesus music, and I remember having my music really loud, just singing like no one was listening. The music died down a little. And all of a sudden, clearly, I can hear a voice saying, there's no greater love than me. I was just blown away because there is no greater love than God. When I heard those words, it all made sense. It was clear. It took me being down, me being depressed. Unfortunately, it took all of that. For me to come to Christ. Once again, unfortunately, that's usually how it happens. Who comes to Christ when their life is going right and and you're happy? No, a lot of times it's because, you know, you're down and out. You need some kind of moral support. Giving my life to Christ, I'm no longer the victim. I used to feel sorry for myself. I used to have pity for myself, but now I'm no longer the victim. I actually had to film this video again because I was a little too emotional <laughs> the first time around, but the second time around, I, I'm okay. <laughs> those scars are still there, but those scars remind me who I am today and what, what I've been through, but I appreciate my life more, you know? I know the Lord loved me so much that he, he came to this earth to die on a cross for my sins, which I appreciate every day and I'm very thankful for. One thing that I learned during my journey is that we all have a purpose in life, but it's through Christ that you'll find your purpose in life, you know? You think that you have control of your life, but let me tell you, you don't, okay? I thought I was gonna do dental hygiene, I was gonna do this and that. No, I, I in a million years, would not have guessed that I'd be in Germany right now. God knows what he's doing, okay? But you just have to let him take control of your life and it'll pay off. Trust me, it'll pay off. There's a song that I love and the lyrics or the chorus, it says, it's more like falling in love than something to believe in. And that is so true. I would say that, oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I'm saved. No. When you love the Lord and you crave for Him and you want all of His glory, that's when your life truly changed and that's when your heart starts to change. That's when you start to change. I feel complete now. I'm no longer that lonely, depressed child. I feel complete. A lot of times, it's like you you crave for more in life. You always want more. You're never satisfied until you meet the Lord. That is my story. Please comment down below if you have any questions comments, concerns, and please, if you see someone's question and you have an answer for them, please answer each other's questions. I'd really appreciate that too. And please, if you have a story you'd like to tell or your testimony or whatever, just comment down below and, and we definitely, all of us, would love to hear your story too. So, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for, for your support and all your love and kindness. I love each and every one of you. So I'll talk to you guys later. Bye guys.
a lot of people have been wondering about my testimony for Jesus Christ, so I decided why not make a video about it. So, uh, I'm going to try to go as far back as I can remember. I'm going to try my best and all glory to Jesus. Uh, when I was younger, I didn't believe in God, okay? I, I, uh, my, my parents, they, they're not religious at all, okay? I didn't grow up with the Bible being taught to me. I didn't grow up, uh, with, with prayer. I didn't, uh, grow up with, you know, stuff like a, a religious Christian family do. I, I was nothing like that. Okay, nor did my parents ever try to force Jesus on me or preach to me or anything. They didn't <laughs> bother. Uh, I started to get in this depression thing where I was giving up on life. I I didn't want to do. I didn't want to deal with school. Uh, I just completely didn't want to live anymore. I had no reason to. Uh, I started to get into Wicca, where Izzo actually wanted to become Wiccan, and or a witch. Yes, witches are real. And they're normal people just like me and you, so... I wanted to become a Wiccan. I thought... Uh... Praise the Lord, I never actually got into actually learning spells and chants and all that. Praise the Lord, I didn't do that. Because I don't know what would have happened. I probably would have... Have demons in my house I don't need anymore, so... Uh... I was... Then after that, I started getting into Buddhism. I didn't believe there's a God, but I just liked... Uh, like, the, the Chinese culture and stuff, I was really into that, and I was really into Buddhism. I was really into meditation and all that stuff. And, uh, Buddhist monks, I was really into that stuff, and, uh, you know, it's funny how we try to find something to quench our spirit, we're so thirsty, and we're looking for stuff to do that will help us spiritually, but it's never going to happen, so, but one Easter, there's a movie <laughs> called Jesus Christ Superstar. You guys can uh, look it up on YouTube. Uh, put in Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, this this shows like back in the 70s. It's a musical. It's about Jesus. So I'm like, hmm, Jesus. Then I felt this urge that I want to read the Bible. So... I remember that I, there's a Bible in my basement, so I went downstairs and grabbed this Bible. This is the Bible that brought me to Jesus. Oh, Jesus brought me to Jesus. Or, yeah. <laughs> I had this crazy idea that I'm going to start with Genesis and work my way to Revelations. Nope, didn't work. So, I still felt like I needed more. I felt like... I'm still missing something. So I'm like, okay, what's in the New Testament? So I immediately went to the New Testament, and then I learned who Jesus was, and what the sacrifice has done, and that we can't just be whatever. We have to go to Jesus directly to know him. Then I found out that reading the Bible without the Holy Spirit is useless. Right? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, the Bible is just a book. But when you have the Holy Spirit, 
that book is completely different. Uh, even after reading the Bible, I still felt something was missing. I'm like, what's missing? And when I was Christian, I thought, you know, once saved, always saved. I don't have to stop sinning. Uh, you know, we can't help it. We sin every day, you know. So uh, I got into that, that line. I was like hardcore Christian. I was a sinner, Christian wannabe. I mean, it was, I was hard, hardcore sinner. Uh. And I was a Christian. Yeah, right. Nah. The thing was that I, I never repented. By that, I never had a repented heart. And that means that I never felt sorry for the sins that I'm doing. Because if you truly felt sorry, you wouldn't do them. You don't know Jesus and the truth's not in you. So, I was just a, a, I was a lying, pure hypocrite. That's what I was. I still don't deserve heaven for how I treated Jesus in my past. and This is why I'm so strict on not sinning and living for the Lord. And I kept sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. And I said sorry and figured that I'm still going to heaven. And I wasn't because I was living in constant and willful sins. When I could give it up any second. I just didn't want to. The... If you do it so long, it becomes an addiction. And the only way you're going to break that addiction is if you want it to be broken by Jesus. By Jesus. And I uh, asked Jesus, like, Lord, like, is my last final give up on my sin? I'm like, Lord, Lord, I, I want to actually stop sinning. Lord, I want to live for you and... Actually, he actually started getting serious for Jesus, and that chain was broken, glory to God. And I don't want to sin anymore. I don't want to. A lot of people get mad at me because I preach repentance, and... Look, guys, what I'm saying is that if you sin willfully, like, you actually know what you're doing is wrong, and you do it anyways, and you're making up in your mind, well... You know, we're saved by grace, not by work, so why should I stop sinning? Satan is telling you that salvation by works means that there's absolutely nothing you can do to work your way into heaven. Because it's by Jesus you're going to heaven. But that doesn't mean, you know, sin all you want, free ticket, Jesus died for, Jesus paid the price, so, hey, free ticket, we can sin all we want. That's not what it means. Uh, here, I'll, I'll read you guys, uh, 1 John, 1 John actually helps me a lot, 1 John is a, is a, 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 a powerful book, uh, you know, it, all this glory is for Jesus, I mean, there's nothing that I will ever do to, deserve a thank you, but, in 1st John, chapter 3, I'll start with 5, but you know that he appeared so that we might take away our, that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin either has seen him or known him. That's why I kept sinning. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't want to know him. So, um, I, I just finally got, I just finally, finally decided to give up. I hated sin. I'm like, Lord, I finally want to know you, Lord Jesus. I want to know. I'll, I'm serious, Lord. That chain is broken. And, uh, man, I just wish that 
I mean, there's people that go against me, Christians. Um, Lord, I, I just wish they understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, I pray that this video has blessed you. I mean, this is the best I can get for my testimony. I pray that this will help you and you got to stay strong with Jesus and Hello, my name is Tamara Lankowski and I'm making a series of videos on why as a uh, as I was reading my Catholic Bible, I came to the conclusion that I had to leave the Catholic Church. I would like to share some things with you that um, I believed as a Catholic that did not, that they, those things themselves contradicted the Catholic Bible. Um, and I pray that this is a blessing to you and may the Lord use it to open the eyes of, of all the people that he created. Um, before I begin, I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Lord, you've used so many to teach me through your word. And I pray now that you use me, all the things that you've taught me with regard to this subject, to teach many others through your word, Lord. And we'll give you all the honor and glory. Thank you for all you do through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, now um, I'm just going to begin reading what I've typed up because... Uh, I have a lot, so it's probably going to be four or five parts, ten minutes, about ten minutes each. Um, to begin with, I would like to uh, show you, uh, I, I wrote this for my family, and um, the letter begins like this, to my family. I am writing this letter with utmost love for you. I have spent countless hours in prayer over this letter, and all I ask is that you show your love for me by reading it completely through, praying for God to reveal the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. So to know truth, we must first know Jesus. Someone once said, you really have to hate someone not to tell them about Jesus. Many have asked us why we left the Catholic Church. We have never clearly explained why, but now I feel the need is necessary. I often hear things like, we believe all the same things you believe. My friend, that is not true. That was exactly what I used to say to my mom before I left the Catholic Church. There are so many things that I did that I honestly did not know were even wrong until my mom showed me from the Bible. I must say I was pretty upset at her, but in the end, she was right. I could not stop thinking about the things she showed me from the Bible. Please get out your Bibles and see for yourself what the Bible says. Every verse in this letter, with with except for maybe one or two, is um, coming from the the Bible that's on www.catholic.org slash Bible. You go on there, um, you'll see all the verses that I'm referring to. Please do not just believe me. My goal is to get you searching in your Bibles so that together we can know Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. My goal is not to distance you from God, it's to get you closer to Him. And please remember, I love you. This is not a hate letter. This is not a, I'm better than you letter, or my religion is better than your religion letter. This is a hard love letter. It's just as hard for me to write as it is for you to be reading or listening to. It would be much easier for me to sit quiet and not say anything, but I must let you know what Jesus did for you and for me. Before I begin, I would like to clarify that my faith is not in my church. If it were, I would not be a candidate for heaven. Neither is my faith in my good works. I just can't imagine standing before a perfect and holy God and trying to explain to him how good I am. I would have to be as good as God, which is perfect, and I am far from that. Faith in any church or good deeds never merited anyone heaven. God is not a God of denominations. Jesus said in John 3, 3, In all truth, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. 
My friend, God does not work in the Catholic Church and God does not work in the Baptist Church. God works in the life of each and every born-again believer. It's the body of believers that makes up the church, not some building or some denomination. God uses his word to judge all of heaven and earth. John 12, 48 says, Anyone who rejects me and refuses my words has his judge already. The word itself that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. 2 Timothy 2.15 Make every effort to present yourself before God as a proven worker who has no need to be ashamed, but who keeps the message of truth on a straight path. According to God's word, searching the scriptures is a command. It is not an option. We are not only to read, but study scripture. Can you imagine us dying one day and explaining to God Almighty why we don't pick up our Bibles and read them every day, or study, or pray every day, or go to a church that teaches the rich truths of the Bible? Is God love? Absolutely. But God is also to be feared. It's just like with our children. They know that we love them. However, they should be afraid of the consequences if they choose to disobey. Look at what Jesus says here in Matthew, verses seven, uh, chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. It is not anyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, who will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the person who does the will of my Father in heaven. When the day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name. Work many miracles in your name. Then I shall tell them to their faces. I have never known you. Away from me, all ye evildoers. You see, these were people who professed to be Christians. They really thought that they were Christians. Like I used to think about myself. But the problem is they only knew the Jesus that they were being taught about in their church. But obviously it was not the Jesus of the Bible. Otherwise, God would not have responded the way he did to them in his word. They claimed the name of Jesus, yet he never knew them. They taught in his name, yet he never knew them. They did spiritual things in his name, exorcisms and such, yet he never knew them. They went to church and lived very good lives, and he did not know them. They had many, many, many good works. But here's one thing that I never knew. A person can know all the things about Jesus that they want to know. But the real question is this. Does Jesus know you? And if a person is not born from above the Bible way, then the answer is what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Verse 23 says, Then I shall tell them to their faces, I have never known you. Away from me, all ye evildoers. My family and my friends, it is because of my love for you that I'm writing this. It would be much easier for me to just say nothing, but it would never be right. Keeping my mouth shut if I had the cure for cancer would be nothing but hatred and wickedness. And how much more important is our soul destined to an eternity in either heaven or hell? It is much more important than a cure for cancer. I don't want to face Jesus one day and see his nail-scarred hands and have heaven replay his brutal death on the cross for my sins. And I couldn't love you enough to speak the truth to you. Shame on me if I do that. There are many things that the Catholic Church teaches that contradict even the Catholic Bible. Again, these were things I never knew. Someone had to show me, and the Lord has laid it on my heart to pass the blessing on to you. My prayer is that this causes you to study scripture, that your walk with God will be closer. Please take the time to study for yourself. Look these things up for yourself. Don't just believe me. I could be wrong. Look for yourself. When you see the words and the verses in the Bible yourself, then it's going to stick. Just hearing me say them is not going to help it stick. My prayer, the Bible is supposed to be a mirror for us to live our lives by. God is going to judge us by his word, the Bible, not by our religion or by our work. He's going to judge us by his word. 
He does not have a religion. Please understand this. God does not talk to us through the church. We talk to God through prayer, and God talks to us through the Bible. It is just like an intimate relationship of husband and wife. God is the husband. We are the wife. What kind of a relationship would I have with my husband if I only talk to him when I need something? How about if I only talk to my husband when I was really upset? Or when I needed to be bailed out of something horrible that happened to me? How would my husband feel if I only complained to him and never took the time to thank him for all that he's done for me? Or worse yet, how would my husband feel if I did all the talking and never gave him a chance to talk? Worse even yet, how would my husband feel if I never talked to him at all and never gave him a chance to talk to me? Could I really say I have a relationship? Well, if we don't pray, we don't talk to God. And if we don't read our Bibles, then we don't give God a chance to talk to us. One-way conversations does not equal relationship. If we are not being taught the whole counsel of God and never take the time to read the Bible for ourselves, how can we say we know Him? We do not know Him. A person cannot know Christ without knowing the gospel in His Word. The most they can know is about Christ. And knowing about Christ is not enough to merit heaven. Here are some things that I believed about my Catholic faith that did not agree with Bible teaching. I'm going to continue in uh, part two of my video. And I suppose that's how it is with most young people in, in Holland. You go to church and you... We spent most of our time in church playing checkers and uh, just having having a fun time. And the message uh, uh, never reached us, really, if there was a message. And I suppose there was. Uh, the churches used to be filled in those early days. Uh, I was back in that same church this last October, and uh, a church that seats over a thousand people on a given Sunday when I was there perhaps uh, had only... Uh, 70, 75 people in it. Um, so religion and the, the religious system, although it's very, very uh, strong in Holland, it's the state church, for example, uh, it has turned people off today and uh, people are disenchanted because it has so little meaning. While uh, I attended a Sunday school, uh, a Baptist Sunday school in, Highland, in Holland for some time, uh, there in that school they sang go gospel choruses different from the hymns that we sang in the church. Um, and uh, those had a gospel message in them. And I think even then I became a little bit more sensitive about, about what these songs were saying. I, I thought I would go to heaven only because um, I was doing the things that were expected of me. Uh, I, I, I followed the rules, so to speak, and I went to church and I, I did a lot of bad things in my young years. And uh, I thought that somehow God would understand and he was a, a kind being who, who surely knew that we were not perfect and uh, that someday, uh, as uh, we hear so often, uh, uh, my good works somehow and the good things would outweigh the bad. Uh, but when I came to the United States, uh, it, it was not long at all before I was uh, invited by people to come to, to church and to attend youth meetings. And uh, those people were entirely different from the kind of people that I had associated with in Holland. Uh, in fact, I distinctly remember being invited to, to one meeting where I, I thought they probably had planned an entire meeting around me. And in fact, uh, when I watched them close the doors, I think I saw them lock the doors, and, and I noticed a lot of people looking at me. And when that preacher spoke uh, and, and, and pointed his finger, I thought he was continuously pointing his finger at me. Uh, obviously, he was not, but I thought he was. And I thought the message was pointing in my direction. And it was something I'd never heard. Uh, it was a message uh, 
uh, that spelled out very clearly that man was a sinner and uh, that uh, the wages of sin is death, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And that really puzzled me because I'd never really heard that message before. And I thought this has to be a message made in America. And I wanted to get out of that place, and I did. I convinced my folks to join a different church. They had been attending a certain place. And I thought, we've got to find a place where uh, things are more like they were in Holland. And we, we found such a place. And I remember one time uh, visiting the preacher and talking with him. And uh, I said, I've been to a meeting where they told me I had to be born again. What does it mean to be born again? He put his arm around me and he said, John, just don't go, don't visit those places. They'll get you all mixed up and confused and uh, alarmed about nothing. You're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, well, yes. You believe, don't you? Yes. Well, then why get excited? Uh, and, uh, and he made me feel more comfortable. But you see, it didn't end there because... Uh, from time to time, people would corner me and hand me literature, uh, a gospel tract, or I would be invited to meetings. I met uh, a young lady who became my wife, and she had a brother who, who was just like that. And uh, I no more uh, met him, and he was already preaching at me, you see, with the same kind of message. Uh, we married and uh, lived with her mother, and uh, her mother listened uh, to a number of gospel broadcasts on the radio, early Sunday mornings especially. And we occupied an upstairs bedroom, and I could hear the radio go on at 6 o'clock in the morning and full blast, you know, till 9. And by then I'd had my fill. I didn't want to hear anymore. And I think she did this for me, for my benefit. She, I thought they were all after me. And I was not going to give in to a, a message made in America. I'm a Hollander. I've gone to church all of my life. I've been baptized, confirmed, and done everything I was supposed to. And uh, nobody's going to convert me to some off-brand religion. I actually asked the company I worked for to uh, transfer me. And I moved all the way to California. Got as far away as I could practically one foot in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> but the same kinds of people <laughs> were on that beach. The same kinds of people were on the streets in Los Angeles. My wife got a job at UCLA and the lady she worked for was one of those people. And before long I found myself in another church where a preacher was pointing his finger again. I was becoming involved in a Bible study. Um, I was again singing those kinds of songs that I had heard at one time in Holland. And gradually, I would say gradually, those songs took on new meaning. And I had to come to a point where, as proud as I was, I had to admit that I had been wrong all of these years. And not only I, but there could be a multitude of people out there that, that could be wrong. I didn't think that was possible. And I had to come to the, that point of admitting that, yes, indeed, Scripture is like a mirror, and I see myself, I see the reflection, and I am indeed that sinner that the Bible speaks of. And I knew, I knew that I was, as a sinner, I stood guilty. And if the Bible was indeed true, then I could not go to heaven unforgiven. And uh, it was that understanding then and, and that conviction that, that brought me to Christ. I, I cannot even point exactly to a day from, and say, today I was a, a lost, miserable, hopeless sinner, and the next day things totally changed. Uh, it was a gradual change, perhaps because of my upbringing. Uh, I didn't need to be convinced that there was a God. I didn't, didn't need to be convinced that God created this world. I, I knew that. I knew there was a hell. I knew there was a heaven. Um, so all of those things were understood. 
but it's just that that peace that became mine when I took that step and understood that I had to recognize that I was a lost sinner. Uh, things changed. Things changed uh, marvelously. But again, slowly. Uh, we, uh, we, we then uh, had an interest in studying the scriptures. Uh, we loved the fellowship with other believers, which before I would have no part of. Uh, I became involved in a singing group and, and, and the various gospel ministries. And, uh, and so gradually uh, the Christian life, and which now of course is quite a few years ago, uh, I'm still learning so many things today, but uh, each day it seems that, uh, that God teaches us new lessons. When I came home after I became a Christian, I came back to Wisconsin for a vacation and I told my father what had happened to us. Uh, he reacted violently, and I remember him shaking his fist at me, and he says, don't talk to me about this, I will not listen, we're in a church, in the church, and uh, you're not going to talk us out of this church into another church. And of course, this had nothing to do with church, but uh, he reacted violently. Then shortly after that, he had a heart attack, and ended up in a hospital, and he was seriously ill. And I remember visiting him, and he grabbed my hands and he said, John, don't let me die. I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready. And he cried. He wept. He says, don't let me die. I'm not ready. Um, a short time after that, uh, while working as a custodian in my, my brother's store, uh, he one night knelt by his mop and his pail and committed his life to Christ. That totally changed him, changed my mother, my, my sisters, my one brother, and uh, the entire family changed and was slowly, gradually converted one by one. My dad, uh, some years after that, died of cancer, and uh, he died with a song on his lips and a song in his heart. That time he was ready, and that's when Christianity counts. Hey everybody, it's Melissa, and I'm so excited to do this video. First, my little girl is asleep. I have a little monitor uh, that I watch her. I just put her down. So if she makes noise, I'm watching her, okay? Um, next, this is a beauty channel. I do uh, makeup and I do reviews and tutorials and I talk about cosmetics and give my, uh, you know, points and tips and all that. So this is not my normal video and I just want y'all to know that. Now the reason why I'm doing this video is because this is the most requested and the most asked question that I get. Melissa, how do you stay happy? You are always positive and upbeat. I wish I was like that. Can you give us, can you do a video on it? So uh, here I am and uh, I'm just going to totally be honest with y'all. I am just going to speak from my heart. I don't even know what I'm going to say. If y'all are subscribed to me, you know that I just get in front of a camera, press record, and then whatever comes to my head, that's what I say. I don't know. So, uh, for my subscribers, this is for you, okay? Um, and any new people, this is for you, too. Um, first thing, I'm flattered by, by that. You know, I, I don't see myself as, I guess y'all do, just always upbeat and all that. I'm just myself. But I want you to know, too, that I'm just like you. I am human. I'm not always happy. I'm not always upbeat and goofballish and all that because that's just not how we're made. We all go through ups and downs, you know, and I do, too. And, and you know, I'm most, the majority of the time, I'm this way. Now, when I really am, am down and out, and I'm around other people, I really try to um, 
be happy and more and upbeat even if I don't feel good inside because I don't want to be you know what do they call it Debbie Downer or whatever it is you know you know I don't want some people you can be around and they, the energy just brings you down um, so I'm always trying to put on a smile and, uh, and just a positive attitude now let me tell you a little bit about myself okay I um, grew up in a Christian household down in the south if you can't tell um, and um, about 15 years old I started really rebelling this is kind of like my testimony and I'm not ashamed of it because where I've come from and where I am now is just it's just incredible and I can't tell y'all all everything within 10 minutes you know YouTube will only allow me 10 minutes to talk so I can't tell you everything but um, so I started rebelling about 15 years old um, I started skipping school hanging out with the wrong group drinking doing drugs um, all that stealing uh, you know just all that kind of stuff and it wasn't the typical teenage stuff either it went beyond that you know it was heavier drugs and drinking and <clears throat> we just I just used to say it was a weekend thing well then it slowly became more than that um, so I was doing that now I almost didn't didn't graduate high school because I had missed so many days that they barely let me through um, so I was I was just so unhappy um, and I was just searching for something and I didn't know I didn't feel complete inside um, my poor parents would all they had to go through snuck out of the house in the middle of the night I kept a ladder up under my bed my my parents were very strict and I was even sneakier than they were um so anyways i did that up until i was <clears throat> whoo, late 20s um i got married to my wonderful husband at age 25 and um that was in 2005 and uh we he w went to a christian school and raised the same way but got involved you know in drinking and all that well I was worse than him. I started drinking every single night. I started having, staying up all throughout the night and then getting up, going to work, all hungover. Well, eventually led into a big time addiction with alcohol and drugs. And I actually had to be um, in the hospital a few times and I just was an alcoholic. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so. In 2008, I talked to my husband, and I was just bawling, crying. You know, in that time, there was a lot of things that I had done that I wish I could take back. And I wish I could today, but it has made me who I am today. Um, so, I went to my husband, and I just started bawling, crying. Because I was an alcoholic. I was drinking all throughout the night. I would hide alcohol, hard liquor, whatever. And uh, drugs, too. And... Uh, so I went to my husband and I said, look, I can't live like this anymore. We need to do something about it. And I was going through a lot of anxiety, trying to get off alcohol. And it was just crazy. I mean, I was, you know, I had the shakes, everything. So I was in the shower and um, I just started bawling, crying. Because uh, I felt so bad trying to get off the drugs and alcohol. And I just dropped on my knees and I just lifted my hands up and I was bawling, crying. And I was lord jesus i cannot go through life like this anymore please lord jesus i'm at my wits end i don't i can't stop this addiction i didn't have my baby at the time um, and i knew i wanted to be a mother i just i just gave it all to the lord i said i can't live this way when i thought about telling y'all this i was crying but <clears throat> for some reason i'm not now but um so I just repented and I just asked the Lord to come into my heart, forgive me for all my past sins and fill me up with his spirit. You know, just I want to walk like I see some of these Christians. Now, a lot of people call themselves Christians, but they but they're not or they don't live it. God wants us to live it, you know, and, and when you live it, 
that is when you get the most benefit out of being a Christian. So, I sort of read my Bible every morning. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be in His Word. So, I didn't understand a thing that it was saying, but I read a little bit every single morning. Uh, didn't know what I was reading, so I started praying quietly, you know, and... Uh, 30 minutes a day. I still do that to this, to this day. I've read through the Bible twice, and I tell you, I still have a hard time understanding what it says. But God sees that I'm trying and that I that I started to try. So he, he eventually gave me the desire to get to know Him more. And uh, all, this, all this about Him started unfolding. I started understanding and living my life for him. I don't drink alcohol. I don't cuss. I don't hang around the wrong people. That's the biggest thing. Another thing, get rid of your negative uh, friends. Get rid of the people that are bad, that are cussing, that are uh, drinking all the time, that are partying. When it comes down to it, it's just you and Christ, you know, and this life is so short and people don't realize that it is so short. So at the end of your life, what are you going to do? God is going to stand right in front of you and your mom is not going to be there. Your daddy's not going to be there. Your husband's not going to be there. It's just you and Christ. And I want him to know that I tried my best. I'm not perfect. I stumble all the time, but I know staying in his word every morning keeps me on track. If I miss a morning, I feel this bit of attachment. Do you feel like there's like a wall in between you and God? Like if you pray, do you feel like there's a wall there? Well, I'm telling you, if you just start reading His Word, even if you don't understand it, that wall will slowly come down and you'll feel like you actually have a relationship with Christ. Um, so, I don't believe that you get to heaven through works. I've been on mission trips. I've even been to Israel. It's not works. You do works because you have the desire to spread the word of Christ. And that's what Christ wants us to do. So anyways, that's just a small, small, small uh, introduction to who I am and how I came to know Christ and why I stay so happy. It is because of Christ, and it's because I read His Word, and He just dwells in me and makes me a happy person inside and out. I cannot tell you how amazing it is. The biggest thing is read His Word, walk the walk. Don't just talk it, okay? I hope y'all have a fabulous day, and I hope I didn't scare y'all. off. Hi. So, I want to share with you all my testimony of how I came to Jesus and how Jesus completely saved and transformed my life. Um, and I want to share this with you so um, possibly it could, you know, plant a seed in your heart if you haven't yet come to Christ and hopefully, you know, Speak to somebody, if anyone's watching this, speak to somebody and let them know that if if my life can be changed by God, that yours can too, and that you can be saved. So, um, okay. So I was born and raised in the Catholic Church. You know, I was Catholic my whole life. Um, I did, I had all the sacraments, whatever, the, um, confirmation, all those things. Um, and throughout all that, I never um, had any real relationship with Jesus. We, I never really learned about we never really learned about the Bible. We never learned really about the gospel. We never really learned about truly having a relationship with Jesus. We never learned about salvation. And, you know, I'm not trying to, like, say anything negative or bad about the Catholic Church or whatever, but th that's just how I feel. We never were taught about Jesus. 
and we were never were taught about salvation. We were never truly taught about why Jesus came here to die for our sins and, you know, to pay the price for our sins. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess that was kind of brought up, but it wasn't, like, emphasized. And it, it was never, like, rep the repenting from sin and, um, you know, living a godly life and salvation, like was never real. I never knew about it through my whole, like, 18 years of being Catholic. We, like, I didn't know what being saved meant. I didn't know, like, about heaven and hell. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know that I needed to have a relationship with Jesus. I just thought... If you believed in God and you were a good, not even, not even believing in God. I thought that you went to heaven if you were a good person. That's what I believed my whole life up until a year ago. And that's kind of what I got out of the Catholic Church. That's what I, that's what I believe that I was taught there. So, um... I have always been very, um, very shy, very concerned about what other people thought about me. I would always, you know, I had such anxiety of talking in front of people. Not only that, I want wanted people to like me so badly and just wanted to be accepted so badly that I would do things that I didn't even want to do just to, you know have friends and just for people to like me um, and you know I just have always been very shy and have just really dealt with so much anxiety my whole life like before like I almost like I felt like I would have like many panic attacks if I had to like speak to people sometimes like it was bad I really had like social phobia almost in certain situations um and it really affected my life um in high school um I you know I started partying and getting drunk and doing stupid things like that and I felt like drinking and getting drunk and partying and doing all those things I felt like that allowed me to be outgoing and to let loose and to be myself, I thought, you know, I thought, oh, I'm going to get drunk and then I'm going to be talkative and outgoing and people are going to like me. And, you know, that's actually kind of what happened for a little while. I, it, like, drink, getting drunk was my, like, escape. I was like, okay. Um, I'm just going to have fun and do what I want and do this. And so that lasted for like three years, from probably like junior year of high school, senior year of high school, and like my freshman year of college too. Um, I just got so drunk all the time and just, you know, partied. Um, did other things that were not good. I, I don't even want... It's not even necessary for me to, like, talk about all of it, but pretty much I was using partying and drinking and stuff as a way for me to feel good about myself and as a way for me to just let go of the anxiety that I had and let go of the shyness that I've always had and just be outgoing and just be fun and have people to like me um and so about a year ago a little less but around no like a year ago I guess um I came home from college for the summer this is when I went away to college um I transferred and I live home now 
But And that was another thing. I was kind of upset and down that I had to transfer and live at home. And I was going through a pretty rough time. I was kind of depressed. Um, things happened that just weren't good for me. And um, I really was just going through a rough time when I got home from college last year. I was really upset all the time. I, th- I, was, pre- I was depressed. Um, and seriously, one day I, you know, decided that I was going to go to church, that I was going to go to this, not the church I used to go, not the Catholic church that I was brought up in, but a holy, a spirit-filled church in White Plains, WCWC. And I knew about it because my aunt and uncle used to go there. So seriously, one Sunday I just went. God directed my steps and put it in my heart to go there. And ever, I I can't even describe, like I went in there and I just started crying (laughs) and I didn't even know, like, I just had this overwhelming feeling come over me, and I didn't know what it was at the time. It's like, what is this feeling? It's, um, and, I mean, now I know that it was God. <laughs> Obviously, it's God, it was God's presence, just, I've never experienced God's presence before, before that day, and ever since that day, my heart has just been on fire for God. God came into my life. I started seeking God. I started reading the Bible. I start. I started going to the, this church every Sunday. I. I just couldn't get enough. I. I couldn't get. I couldn't. I just. I wanted more and more. I was like, I wanted more of this. This feeling that I kept getting. Um, and then I remember the day I got saved. I called out to Jesus. I was like, Jesus, please just forgive me for, for what, for wasting my life up until now. Forgive me for my sins. I, I accept your sacrifice. I accept that you died for me in the cross, on the cross, and that you know, you rose from the dead and you paid the price of my sins so I can be saved. I accept your sacrifice. I accept you. And I got saved and (laughs) I got baptized. And it was honestly, since then, it's, my whole life has completely turned around. Like literally, I didn't know it was possible. I didn't know it was possible from my life to have changed the way it did and not just my life my whole my heart um it's just amazing god is amazing jesus is amazing jesus can save you jesus wants a relationship with you he doesn't want you to keep living the way you're living if you're living in sin he wants to to rescue you he wants to save you he wants to change your life. He doesn't, you know, he won't He won't judge you right now. He understands what you're going through. You just have to look and turn to him and seek him. Seek his face and just be okay with being vulnerable and just giving your heart to him and once you just let go of anything holding you back it's the most amazing thing in the whole I can't like I'm not, I don't even know what to say cuz it's so amazing Jesus is everything he he I've never felt such peace such freedom such love such joy such Just throughout, even, you know, I obviously still have, like, struggles that I go through, but throughout 
all of the hardship, all of the struggle, all of the everything. I know Jesus is with me and he gets me through it. it just life is different. You, Your eyes will open up. You will see the world. You will see life. You will see everything in a completely different way that you never have seen before. Jesus will open up your eyes. He will open your heart and you will just experience life like you never have before. And not only that, but you will be saved from eternal eternal separation from God. Hell, you will be saved and you will have eternal life and you you will be saved. And it just having just knowing that in your heart is is just it's so freeing. So that's my testimony and I hope that whoever is watching this video, I hope that um, maybe it could inspire you. Maybe it could encourage encourage you. Um, if you haven't already, just to turn to Jesus and to give your life, to give your heart to him, to place all of your faith in him. Jesus is the answer. He is the answer. People look for, for satisfaction, for happiness, peace life and so many things in this world I was looking for it in you know alcohol and things like that and um only Jesus only Jesus can provide for you what you're looking for it's true that is the truth it is the absolute truth and if you just Turn to him, cry out to him, and just give your heart to the Lord. If you do that, you will know what I'm talking about. It's true. This book, this, the Bible is true. It is true. It is true. It is true. I'm telling you, it is true. I never read the Bible up until you up until not that long ago, um, reading this book, reading the Bible will change your life. It will change your life. So I encourage you to do so. Um, okay, so thanks for listening. Um, I'm going to try and make more videos um i really i think god put it on my heart to like start some i really have just been you know trying to see what god has in, you know god has planned for me for my life i want to help other people who are once like me i want to reach out to the lost i want to um you know be able to reach yeah, to reach out to the lost and just bring people to God, bring people to Jesus and just preach the gospel of Jesus. And um, maybe YouTube could be a way for me to do that. Um, you know, that's what I've been thinking. So I'm, I might try and start making some YouTube videos, um, encouraging videos to you, to whoever's watching. Um, about Jesus and about his just absolute amazingness and how he will completely blow your mind. I can't even put it into words. So, all right. Thank you and God bless you. We will not live forever. One day, suddenly, unexpectedly, our time will be up. That happened to me 12 years ago, July 28th, 1998. I woke up one morning with a terrible pain in my chest and I knew that my time was up. I had a heart attack. I just knew my time was up, my friends. It was the most devastating thing that happened to me. I just knew my time was up. 
I said to my wife, please pray for me because I'm dying. I knew I was not coming back and then I collapsed. My friends and I went down a deep black hole. Even though I was a Christian, I was born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I was on my way to hell. I was going down. I left my body and I went down a deep black hole. My friends, I was never as scared of my life as that day because I knew I was not coming back. My time was up. We don't know when our time is up. My friends, I was a very fortunate. I pleaded with Jesus. I asked him to let me come back. And he gave me grace and mercy. He let me come back to come and warn you that any moment your time will be up. My friends, it is destined for man to die once and thereafter comes judgment. It comes so quickly, so unexpectedly. Nobody is really prepared for it when it does happen. Are you ready? Should your time be up today? Will you be ready to face judgment? We have the opportunity now, my friend, to prepare, to go on our knees and speak to Jesus, to ask him for forgiveness, to plead for mercy. My friend, once you die, there is no more time for mercy. Then it's judgment. Are you ready? Are you ready to die? Are you ready to face judgment? If you neglect that, my friend, then it might be forever too late. People postpone the idea. They don't like it. And then they say, OK, I'll worry about it another day. My friend, there might just not be another day. Many people are studying the prophecies because they are hoping for more time, more time to enjoy the world, more time to do what they want to do. But my friend, suddenly, very suddenly, our time will be up and then we will face judgment. Are you ready, my friend, to face Jesus? Not one single unrepented sin will be tolerated, my friend. We've got to be always packed and ready to meet the Master. We've got to be always expecting His coming. Because if we're not ready, my friend, we will have a disastrous landing on the other side. Are you ready? To face the master. May Jesus bless you. Hi, my name is Jacqueline, and I just wanted to share with you my story of how God changed my life. Well, before I, I knew the Lord, what happened was that um, at the age of about 14, 15, I went through really bad depression. And a lot of people know me and say, how could you be through depression? You've had an amazing family. You grew up in an awesome home. You have health, beauty, everything's fine for you. But what happened is that um, my grandma got into a bad car accident. My mom's uncle had a heart attack and passed away. I was really nervous to get into high school. And it was so many things, just a million different things happening. And I kept thinking and thinking and thinking and worried. Oh my gosh, how about if this happens to me? How about if my family, something happens to them? How about if I die? How about where am I gonna go after I die? And it was just so much fear and, and it consumed my whole body where I would be sitting down and from thinking so much, I started getting really bad panic attacks and anxiety attacks. So my body would start shaking. My heart would pound as if I ran a marathon. You can literally like see it almost coming out of my chest. I get really, really, really dizzy. I feel like I can't breathe and hands are choking me and my whole body would go weak and I would get whispers in my head saying, there's no point to life. It's the same garbage every day. And I always say depression is the worst disease ever because when you don't have any hope, there's nothing to hold on to. And if you guys get to know me, I'm really bubbly and outgoing. I love being around people. But the only thing I wanted to do was just go to my room, close the door, and just sleep. One thing would put a smile on my face. I just want to sleep. I want to escape this world. It just, I felt like there's no point to life. There's no point to living. And like everybody would be around, they'd be laughing and smiling. I'd be like this. 
just so sad, looking at everyone, I go, how can people be happy? And I went through really bad depression for about one year. And what happened was that I literally felt, and any of you guys that have gone through depression or are maybe going through it right now, you feel like you're dug so deep into inside a, a pit and there's no way out. Or like on top of this roller coaster and you're stuck and there's no way out of it. And people say, oh, it's in your hands, but it's something that you just can't control. It's, 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 it's the worst thing ever. I don't wish on anybody. But I wanted to just to share with you my story and to encourage you guys, because if you get to know me, you guys always see I'm filled with so much joy. And there's a verse in the Bible that says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And this is where I got it from. Well. Because I was going through so much depression, my mom took me to the doctors. They wanted to give me depression pills. And I called my aunt and I said to her, they want to give me depression pills. And I told the doctor, God's going to heal me. Did I believe it? Absolutely not. I said, God, what are you going to do? Snap your fingers and heal me? It's been over one year. They want to pull my credit from school because I'm getting random panic attacks. I leave school. No one knows what's going on. They're going to think I'm crazy. I'm 14, 15 years old. So. I called my aunt and my aunt is so in love with Jesus. She looks at me, she goes, Jacqueline, God changed my life. Believe me, he did it for me, he could do it for you. And I was laughing, I said, what? She goes, read your Bible, pray, just trust in him, he's so amazing. He's the same God that changed my life. Before I went through depression, I wanted to try to commit suicide because, because of my condition. My legs are paralyzed from the car accident and I got in, but God gave me this joy. And I looked at her and I said, I want what you have. So I started attending this amazing youth group. And one time we're, we're in the middle of church. I walk in, people are clapping and they're singing. And I'm like, whoa, these, these so-called Christians, they're not so weird. They're really filled with joy. And we were in the middle of a church service group and all of a sudden I got the worst panic attack ever in the middle of church. I laid on the bench, my body started shaking. I literally felt like the devil standing over me, choking me. And I crumpled in a ball and I go, oh my God, if you love me, I'm like, kill me. I don't want to live anymore. I can't take it. And my body's shaking. I got a bad panic attack. And, and I'm like, help me. I'm getting a panic attack. They started praying. They're like, in Jesus' name, God did not give you the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus, who Jesus sets free, free indeed. They started praying for me. And God is my witness within a few minutes, not even. My panic attacks would last two, 20 minutes actually, to about an hour sometimes. Within two minutes, my body calmed down. I felt the world was on my shoulders and it got lifted up. My heart stopped pounding. I felt so relaxed, so much peace. And I'm laughing and I'm crying and I cannot explain to you the feeling. And I'm going to tell you, God is my witness since that day. They told me every time you get scared, you're going to get a panic attack. You just say, who the king sets free is free indeed. I went back to my doctor and she goes, you seem so happy today. What's going on? I said, I told you God's going to heal me. And he did. I took absolutely no medicine. It's been over five years and a half. I've never gone through that again. And you know what I do right now? I'm actually helping and mentoring girls that are going through depression and, and feeling like there's no point to life. And it's so amazing. And I just want to encourage you guys, even if you're not going through depression and you're going through something else and you're like, why am I going through this? Why me? Believe me, there's a reason to everything. If God will bring you to it, he's going to take you through it. And trust me, he'll never leave you. He'll never fail you. And I, I'm just a living testimony. And I just wanted to share with you guys, just to encourage you all. If God changed my life, he could do the same for yours. And I'm filled with so much joy and so much happiness. And I'm so satisfied with God. I'm, I'm only 22 right now. And I'm filled with so much joy. I don't need to smoke. I don't need to drink. I don't need to go clubbing. All that before, I would look towards those stuff to fill me up with joy. But it was only, it was only only temporary. Now, I'm telling you, like I'm on here taking time to record just to tell you guys how amazing God is and how much he changed my life. And if he did it for me, he wants to do it for you and nothing is impossible with God. And I would encourage you that don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big the God that you serve is. So just be blessed and that's where I get my joy if you guys are all wondering. Hey everybody, this is Minister Carl. I want to come through and just share with you my testimony, my part of my story, uh, my journey to freedom from homosexuality. Was that the only thing I've been delivered from? No. <laughs> I have lots of things I've been delivered from, lots of stories I could share, but I want to share this one in particular uh, of my deliverance from homosexuality. I lived probably um, a good 12 years or more of my life as a homosexual. Just my journey to freedom, and I hope that this gives someone uh, encourages someone to seek out freedom, to seek out God, to seek out the possibility of being delivered, the possibility of being free. 
And, um, and I want, to know, want you all to know that when you encounter Jesus Christ, it's no, longer, it's no longer a possibility. It's a probability that you'll be free. I remember for years of my life, I battled with sexual identity issues. Is this who I am? Is this the way I was born? Was I born gay? Um, you know, why can't I be who I want to be? So on and so forth. Um, and I remember uh, all the times of uh, molestation, of, of rape, of abuse, of verbal abuse, and all the different things that I've gone through. But something happened in my life when I encountered Jesus that changed my life forever. And so this is just a little part of that story, and I hope it blesses um, you. When I was a little kid, I was, I was born... Um, in 1988 and my mother my father um, they divorced shortly after I was born not too long after I was born I was very I don't even remember it was real real young okay, so after they divorced um, I didn't really spend too much time with my father I didn't really have an amazing amazing relationship with him until I turned about 16 and that's kind of when the, my relationship with my dad kind of got started more and intensely, you know, and, and helped to build to where we are today. Um, but when I was a little kid, I was probably around the age of uh, seven or eight when I was sexually molested by a family member who had been entrusted with the duty of teaching me about the birds and the bees, you know, as they deemed it. And um, I remember... I remember that day he was teaching me, he was supposed to be teaching me about sex and, and all of that. And I remember that day um, we were in the room and he said to me, um, I can show you better than I can tell you. And that's kind of where the molestation started. And it went from that, that age, probably about seven or eight, up until the time I was about 14 years old. The molestation continued with him. Um, and and I'm not going to say that the molestation is what led me to homosexuality. You know, people ask the question, they say, well, can you be born gay? And this is my response to that. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to be um, super knowledgeable like a scientist would be to be able to give you some kind of scientific explanation or DNA tracing or any of that. I can't, I can't do that because I'm not that person. And I'm not going to pretend to be God and try to give you God's answer. But what I will say is this, what I do know, Scripture tells us this, that we are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So, yeah, in, in essence, you can be born gay because homosexuality is a sin just like anything else. And we're all born in sin. When we're born, we're open to murder, lying, cheating, stealing, anything. We're open to do anything that's outside of the will of God because our nature is a sinful nature. Our nature is a wrong nature. Well, what do you mean? In the big, you'll hear people say um, that we're all made in the image of God, but that's not true. In the in it used to be true, but when sin entered the earth, it was no longer true. In the beginning, God made Adam and Eve right in the garden, and it was a perfect place. But when, uh, and scripture says that they were made, Adam and Eve were made in the image, imagio Dei, of God, the image of God. Uh, but the scripture tells us that when sin entered the earth, when, when they disobeyed God, when they sinned, scripture says that we are no longer created or made in the image of God, but we are made in the image of Adam, which means simply this, we are made with a fallen nature. We are made in the image or after the likeness of our forefather, Adam, whose nature changed the moment he sinned. And, and as a result, we have our nature is to do wrong. Our nature is to sin. Our nature is to go against God. Living a disciplined lifestyle, living a life after God is not normal for us as human beings. It's not because we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Whatever your sin, whatever your iniquity, whatever your issue, we all were born in.
And then what happens is from the moment you're born, from the moment you're born into the earth realm, the enemy seeks to uh, reinforce this fallen nature, reinforce this wrongdoing, reinforce these wrong mindsets, these wrong belief systems. He seeks to, uh, to, to set things in order so to keep you from ever coming into the knowledge of who God is, to keep you from ever coming into the knowledge of who you really are because God has an ultimate identity for you. Jesus said it, he gave us a, as our ultimate example. He said, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it's written of me. What he was declaring was, I found myself in the book. <laughs> I found myself. Even Adam, when Adam sinned, God, it says, the scripture says that the voice of God walked into the garden and said that the Bible says that Adam hid in fear because the, and the Lord said, Adam, where art thou? Where are you, Adam? God wasn't looking for Adam. He knew exactly where Adam was. He, the eyes of the Lord are in all places, beholding everything. What was God saying? God was saying, Adam, find yourself. You've lost yourself. You have now because of sin lost who you are and that's the great thing about god is in him there is an ultimate identity that the enemy seeks to reinforce through issues and circumstances your fallen nature but when god comes check this out so like i said uh, i was born in sin shaped in iniquity i had i had homosexual desires and feelings before I was ever even molested. I have to say that because I don't want to attribute it to the molestation as if to say the molestation is the reason that I was gay. That's not true. I had I had homosexual desires before the molestation. But the molestation, as well as the absence of my father and a number of other things, uh, the spirit of rejection and so on and so forth, contributed to the normalizing of that nature, contributed to my fallen state and and contributed to me embracing and living a homosexual lifestyle so when i turned 14 a friend of mine invited me to a church highway word of faith underneath bishop uh, carl a turner in newark delaware uh, where i was sitting in the service and the preacher was preaching and and I, you know i've seen Pentecostal people on TV before and all of that and I always thought all my life oh god these people are fake it's ridiculous da, 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 you know all of this stuff and he was preaching and it was like in this moment everybody else in the room disappeared and it was just me and the preacher and he was preaching and it was like he was talking directly to me and before I knew it I found myself at an altar with tears coming down receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior into my life and I remember that time that that moment from that moment on, my life has never, ever, ever been the same. Did I, did I stop being gay at that moment? No, absolutely not. I didn't even know anything about deliverance, the process, the journey, anything about that. But I knew that I had encountered God, the real God, and I knew I could never be the same again. So that started the journey, the process of deliverance. But I remember uh, people ask me, uh, they say, you know, well, why did you stop being gay? What made you give up homosexuality? And I want to say this. Nothing made me give it up other than this. No person, no religious system, not society, not peer pressure. Nothing made me give it up except for this, the love of God. That's it. Denying yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And I remember when God spoke that to me because I had gotten to a relationship with this guy and, and uh, I was in love for the first time ever in my life, really genuine love. And I was really upset because everything else in my life I was doing right. I was living righteously with the exception of this lifestyle. And, uh, and I was giving up things. I was, you know, I was changing. I was making a uh, transition. And I, and I fell in love. And I remember saying, God, I don't understand why when I, I do everything else you ask me to, but this one thing that I have and I want it, and I, I, I finally find something that I like and, and that I love and I want to keep. And you're saying that, I, that it's wrong and I can't keep it and I don't understand. And I remember the Lord spoke to me and he said, Carl, if you would lay that down. He said, I understand how you feel. 
and I, and and your feelings, your emotions are legitimate. You know, they're legitimate. He said, but if you lay that down and sacrifice it for me, for obedience, I'll count it unto holiness. And I remember that scripture denying yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Finally clicked and it made sense is this, deny your fallen nature, whatever your issue is, homosexuality, anything, whatever your issue is, deny yourself. Put off the old you and the lust of this flesh and follow Christ. Pick up your cross. That cross where you have to crucify yourself every day. You got to tell yourself, I'm a free will moral agent. And today I choose to live for Jesus. Today I choose to deny my flesh, to tell my flesh, I know what you want, but I know what God wants. And I know that if I follow after God, I'm going to be blessed. And, and I want to say this, in that moment, I realized that at salvation, I was delivered. When you come to Christ at salvation, you're set free. You're delivered from every issue, everything. You're, you're delivered. Then begins the journey of freedom. But you have to have a revelation of that journey. You have to have a revelation that deliverance is at salvation, but freedom is the process that you're going to have to go through every day. That denying of yourself, that putting off of the flesh, that that casting your cares upon him, you're going to have to go through the process and it's not easy. It's, it's, it's a hard process, but I promise you that when you submit it to God, he's going to change your desires. And before you know it, one day you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, wow, I'm free. One day you're going to wake up and realize that he who the sun sets free is free. Indeed. You can be free today. Whatever your issue is, whatever your stronghold, maybe it's homosexuality. Maybe you've never even embraced the fact that you struggle with homosexual temptations, homose homosexual issues. But I want to tell you this today. You have to embrace it in order to change it. Some people embrace their struggle and stay at the embrace, you know, and they become comfortable with who they are, as they say. Uh, but... If you do that, you've, you've, you've sold yourself short. You've, you've stopped yourself from the process. You have to embrace it and say, okay, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I struggle with. Okay? And then make up your mind, but I'm going to beat this thing. I heard Prophetess Bynum say one time, don't be so quick to rebuke a devil. Sometimes you got to labor with that demon. Until you learn it and it learns you so that the next time it comes around, whether it changes its voice, its hairstyle, what it looks like, you'll recognize it. And I want to tell you today, that's what I did. I embraced it and I learned it. And every time I would mess about, I'd say, okay, God, teach me. What did I do wrong here? What could I have done better? What led up to this? What did I give into? Search me, O Lord, and know my ways. The psalmist said, I acknowledge, I acknowledge me and I look at, I, I acknowledge, that's what it is. I acknowledge my iniquity before you. Acknowledge it. Embrace it. Give it to God. Submit it. And watch God move in your life. Watch him change you. Watch, watch freedom become not... Not some laborious thing where, you know, you're, you're, you're up one day and down the next and it's all these issues. And if you're trying to be free in your own self, your own works, you're never going to get it. And it's always going to be frustrating. And that's why people say they're delivered and then two years later they're back in the same life. Give it to God. And say, God, I'm going to live for you as you show me how. Teach me. Show me. I give you my best. You handle the rest. So that's my story. That's a little bit of it. I'm in, right now in the process of writing a book that will be out next year sometime, uh, 2013. Look for it and pray for me. And I pray for you because we all on a journey. I got my weaknesses just like the next person. And it's a temptation every day. I choose to be free. Every day I wake up, I choose to build my relationship with Jesus. And I, I'll tell you this. Some people say, you're crazy. You know, I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it. Nobody asked you to believe it. This is my story. It's, it's not your story. This is my story. I believe it because I live it. And, and this is who I am every day. The same praise I give God at church is the same one I give him in my bedroom, on the street, at the grocery store. The same freedom that I have in the sanctuary is the same freedom that the same freedom I'm talking about on this video. It's the same freedom I have right here in my own home. I have to I have to choose to take the responsibility 
responsible responsible is simply this response able i'm able to give a response are you able to give god a response today my response is lord i submit it to you and i believe that you're more than able thank you for watching i love you all Be blessed. what a blessing it has been to hear these precious folks sharing what god has done in their lives you know this Jesus, he's probably the most controversial person in all of creation. At least down here on this planet. People use his name as a swear word. I've done that. Didn't have a clue that I was offending God by using his name as a swear word. Well, Perhaps you've been flipping channels and you're not sure what you're watching. This is the Precious Testimonies broadcast. You can learn more about us by going to our uh, ministry website. That should pop up there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you can't see that, it's just www.preciousTestimonies.com. And you'll go to our website. If you punch that up on the internet and you'll be able to read uh, many, many other Jesus-glorifying testimonies, such as what you've heard on this broadcast. Also, there are other video testimonies you can watch, and there are Christian writings on the website. So there's uh, various spiritual resources for people uh, to uh, help in their relationship with God if they go to the website. We encourage people to pray about getting in contact with us. Uh, if they want to have their written testimony published on that website and or if they would like to uh, have their video testimony connected uh, to these broadcasts in any particular way, why we want to see what God uh, would want to do okay, regarding that uh, issue. My friend, as we uh, move to the end of this broadcast, I just want to address those of you who may be watching this and you are wondering more than maybe ever before about this one called Jesus. What do I do about this Jesus? What am I expected to do by God regarding Jesus? Or is this Jesus what is the thing thing or person that I'm missing in my life. In fact, my friend, you might be in a place right now where you're so discouraged with life that you would, you're close to probably wishing it would end. Or maybe you wished it would end a long time ago. Or maybe you're so frustrated you don't know which way to turn. Well, I want to encourage you, my friend, consider what I'm about to share with you. None of us know when our heart is going to stop. God can give us that desire real quick to be done with this life. And the New Testament Bible says there's two places that we're going to go ultimately once we die. One group of people will spend eternity with the Creator, God Himself, and they will experience joy forevermore. The other group, the Bible says, is a broader group. Many more people will go this way. They will be separated from their Creator, their God, for eternity once judgment has been pronounced in their lives. And they will spend eternity away from God. They will be in hell. A place where they're not only separated from God, but they will know for eternity they could have had the other eternity. That other eternity where a few chose the only way that God has provided for humanity to be right with him. That other way is 
through none other than Jesus Christ.